Uh, greetings and welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary. For today, we get a chance to jump into Lent as we take a look at Genesis 22, verses 1 to 18. This text is an oldie and a goodie. It's a pretty familiar one. After all, it's the Aqaba, the binding of Isaac. Within this text, there's a lot going on. And rather than turning this into a two-hour course lecture, which it is fully capable of becoming, I'm going to draw your attention to some major highlights that will be helpful for your preaching and teaching. Genesis 22, after all, is set in a context of Genesis in which the Zerah, the seed, has been very much in jeopardy. It's in this context of the Zerah that we now turn our attention to Genesis 22, beginning at verse 1, just to see what's going on. Genesis 22, verse 1, the story starts out relatively simply. With the simple expression, Vayahi ahar hadavarim ha'ela. And it happened after these things. The these things is pretty important. These things refers to the drama that has unfolded ever since Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12, that pivotal text in which many big promises were made, especially the Zerah, the seed. The seed has been in jeopardy time and time again. Sagar and Hagar, the wife, sister swap, not once, but twice. And now we bring into the key point in the text that sets up the rest of the story. Elohim Anesah et Abraham. And God tested Abraham. This word Nesah, this word for testing, implies that this is not just any sort of exam. It is Abraham's final exam, if you will. It's the test that will be a chance for Abraham to prove his faithfulness to Yahweh, which, given what's gone on since chapter 12, has been very much in jeopardy. Now, with this supernatural, te uh, supernatural test, we now turn our attention to the test itself, moving on to, verses, to verse 2. And he said, Take kakna, good old particle of politeness, the na, and note the descriptors. They're pretty brutal. Et binka, your son. Okay, that's nifty. He has a couple options at this point. Et yahidka. Oh no, now we're in trouble. Your only son. And then we get to the great punchline here. Asher ahavta et yitzak, whom you love, namely Isaac. And the drama builds. Isaac, who is a passive character in almost the entirety of Genesis, now comes to the forefront. He cannot escape and now takes on this role of being the passive sacrifice in a good chunk of the story. And it moves on. Verses 3 to 4 happen. And now it gets us finally to this odd conversation that happens in the next text, namely this awkward moment of Genesis 22, verses 7 to 8, in which we read, Vayomer Yitzhak et Abraham, and Isaac said to Abraham, he suddenly makes a appearance, finally making an appearance to speak, to Abraham his father, and he said, My father, Abraham responds, Here I am, Hanani Bini, here I am, my son. And now we get this awkward moment. Isaac knows everything. He sees everything, but one thing is missing. And Abraham makes his moment of faith with a pretty important statement here in verse 8. And Abraham said, God, you're at low. God will provide the lamb for the whole burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked together. In this moment, everything is at stake. The Zerah, the seed that has been the big deal, Abraham makes a pretty promising statement. A statement that when we learn the punchline of the story, Yahweh Yireh, Yahweh will see to it. And the two of them move on together. Now jumping ahead, we get to the climactic moment here when the sword happens. When the, in verse 10. And this is the big moment. Vayishlach and Avraham. And if you think about the pacing and had you been walking through, it's been actually going pretty quick. 
They've gotten their day's journey. They've seen Moriah in the distant. And now everything slows down. Vayishlak Avraham et Yado. And Abraham sent out his hand. Vayakak, and he took Eth Hamalakaleth, and he took the knife to slay his son. Everything is ponderously slow, and it builds to the tension. He slows down, and this word for ma'elikath is sort of interesting. It's from a call, the word for eating. It's the big honking eating thing. Uh, Rembrandt's uh, painting aside, which has a nice little cute, what, 12-inch knife. Uh, this is a butcher knife. This is not a everyday knife. This is a cleaver. After all, a sacrifice is a brutal business. Everything slows down here. And then suddenly the Malach Yahweh shows up. And he calls from heaven and he says, and Abraham says, the only thing you can say, Hineni, here I am. God intervenes. The Malach Yahweh shows up. The angel of Yahweh shows up. And we have a substitute for Isaac, after all. The lamb who's caught by its thorn, by its horns, the ram caught by its horns in the thicket. And all of this, much is going on. Isaac plays the role of the passive, obedient son who obe obeys even the command to kill. If you can only imagine, Abraham at this is, time is quite old, Isaac not. If I were to place a wager, I would bet on Isaac any day in a fight. Instead, he chooses this pattern of an obedient son. And at the end, we have this restatement of the covenant in verse 18, in verses 17 and 18. As we move to the climax of the text, again, sort of jumping ahead, hitting the highlights as we move on. In 23, verse 5, if we can, as we back up one slide, we can see what's going on is that we have a restatement of the covenant to Abraham, and it's modified in a couple ways. A couple things that happen. One, I will surely multiply your offspring. That we saw in Genesis 16, verse 10. Hence, the stars of heaven, sands on the sea, seashore, which is new here, but we actually see that in Genesis 32, 12. But then, this addition, he will take possession of the gates of his enemies. And then this final reiteration of all the nations of the earth being blessed. Uh, this text is a wealth of issues and all kinds of challenges that have been dealt with in many different contexts. Looking towards the New Testament, we find that Isaac plays a pretty important role. Namely, playing this role, first of all, as the obedient son, a pattern for Christ's obedience that you'll be encountering when you preach on the temptation of Christ, should you go the New Testament route and also we have this language of substitutionary atonement. And of all the things that I would focus in on, it's this ram caught by a thicket as that substitutionary sacrifice that is a type of Christ's sacrifice. And I would play around with that, especially with that great line at the end. And he calls it Moriah, Yahweh Yir Eh, because on this mountain, Yahweh will see to it. And how Yahweh sees to everything on this mountain we learn later that Moriah is connected to the Temple Mount, according to Chronicles, that on this place of sacrifice, Yahweh sees to everything. And in the person of Christ, in Christ's sacrifice and death, Yahweh sees to our sin by providing that perfect lamb, that perfect sacrifice. And that, my friends, is the route that I would probably go with. But boy, if you've been working on the Old Testament and preaching the Old Testament these few weeks, these few months together, uh, it's been an embarrassment of riches. And you can join, jump into Gen Genesis, jump, jump into Lent with this pretty wealthy text here in Genesis 22. May God bless you as your Lenten journey, these busy, glorious times of the church continue as you revel in this glorious text from Genesis 22, verses 1 to 18.